Y'all already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. Eventful weekend. Been an eventful week. And as y'all notice, I haven't been posting as much, and that's because sometimes life takes control. There's a lot that goes on in my life outside of YouTube. I'm not just a YouTuber. I have told y'all that. We are not the same. I am a Martian. So shout out Lil Wayne, man. Anyways, y'all see my brother came home from prison. He's uh, adjusting, learning how to get back to being himself. Tonight we are going to hit Bush Gardens. I'm going to record some of that. I may even live stream. Don't quote me on it. We'll see how that goes. So, if you didn't catch the video with me interviewing my brother, picking him up from prison... Make sure you go catch that so that you'll be up to date when we get to part two. Also, make sure you catch my life part one so that this week, if I decide to do it this week, well, you can catch up, you know, when you get into part two, you know, where we left off of part one. Let's get into the purpose of today's video. I've seen guys come together while locked up. Come together for a bigger reason. Because we're being treated wrong. The food is wrong. The mistreatment has just gotten out of hand. You don't see it as much as you would think you would. I seen it years and years ago. And then as I got later in my bed, there wasn't a lot of unity. There wasn't a whole bunch of men bonding and standing together for things they believed in. The prisons had got people to a point where they had, they had them scared. You didn't want to end up in that hole back there. You would starve. You go back there 250, come out 150. But there was a time when guys stood for something. They stood up for what they believed in. It's been a good amount of situations I've seen where guys either bond together or just by themselves say, hey, enough is enough. I'm not dealing with this. I'm not going to do this to me no more. Today we're going to get into that. Today we're going to get into guys coming together and tearing things up. We'll get into a guy that I've seen go on a hunger strike. And damn near die. We we'll get into when the guards decide they want to do something they're not supposed to do, and the inmates ain't going for it, and what happens? Y'all know I done seen it. You know I done lived it. So let's relive. Now with YouTube, there's a couple things I always try to stay away from, just because people get in their feelings, religion, and politics. You can't talk politics because. No matter what I say, not everybody feels the way I feel. You can't talk religion because no matter what I say, not everybody feels the way I feel. There's a lot of religious people locked up. You got your Muslims, five percenters, Christians, Catholics, Messianic Jewish. The list goes on and on. Your Rastas, you know, Buddhas. You got like... All these different religions, people, you know, turn to God once they get incarcerated. I turned to God once I got incarcerated. I wasn't like a, a Bible thumper, a Bible thumper, somebody that walks around with the Bible all day, goes to church every service. No, I didn't do all that, but I would pray. I got a closer understanding of what it is to believe in something higher than yourself. So I got into each night. I would make sure I prayed. I would give thanks. I prayed before my meals. I still do that to this day I'll be sitting there and I'll just with my eyes open I'll get quiet I don't pray with my eyes closed I'll, I'll get quiet and I'll just sit there and I pray I adopted that in prison the Muslims by far have when it comes to religion I definitely say there's more Christians but the Muslims are more open about their religion they practice they pray they make salat they do all these things you know out in the open and it, it's known they're Muslim now you got a large Christian population but they just not everybody I'm Christian I'm not gonna walk around with a Bible all day so that puts me in the uh, you know different category with these Muslim guys they were very well put together very clean always clean cut their clothes are always ironed they had different things they could order that we couldn't they could order prayer oils prayer rugs, things of that nature that fall in the category of the guidelines of their religion. So they always smell good. They always smell fresh. 
And they were the hookup when it came to getting cologne. Because that's all the prayer oil was. It was just a an oil fragrance that they would take and bottle up and sell small vials to other guys. And they would have all these different fragrances, right? But they had rules set in place with things they could and could not do. Like homosexuality was a no-no. You do not get caught being a Muslim and think that you're going to have a boy or be doing something behind everybody else's back, you know, in a sexual manner and that the Muslim guys are going to embrace you. It's going to turn violent. They're going to hurt you. They're going to try to X you out. It's going to be a bad day to be Muslim. It's going to be a bad day to be gay. It's going to be a bad day to be your ass. I've met a ton of Malcolms, a ton of Muhammads. I mean, that's just like the name everybody adopts. We have a guy named Malcolm. Let me tell you about Malcolm. Malcolm's a lifer. I don't know why Malcolm's got life. I talked to him a bunch of times. I have no clue why he has life. Never got into his case. Malcolm works over at Main Laundry. He gets up first thing in the morning. You can hear him down there, you know, making his prayer. Make, does his breakfast. Heads on over to laundry. Main laundry workers will be there from about 8 in the morning. Some of them come back at about 5 in the evening. Some of them don't come back till 8, 10 o'clock at night, depending on how much laundry they have to wash. Because where we were at, we didn't just do the laundry for 3,700 inmates that were there and the work center next door. We also did the laundry for a couple of the women's prisons and several other prisons that didn't have a main laundry facility there. They would bring tractor trailers in full of dirty, dirty clothes, bags tied up with cell numbers on them to be done. Malcolm would be gone all day, every day. Malcolm gets this young black dude in the cell with him that, and I don't know this dude's name, but he had these like ter terrible acne. When I say young, he's probably maybe 27, but he had like acne scars, but then like almost like keloids. Like it wasn't just acne. These were like knots all over his face to where dude almost looked like a damn puffer fish or he had like the texture. His skin looked almost like a frog. Nobody thinks nothing about it. Malcolm goes on about his, his regular routine, his regular business, working main laundry. I go to the hole. Sitting back in the hole, doing my thing. I ain't got nothing to do. Stare at four walls all day. Catch a book when I can. Yell through the door and talk to somebody. I'm bidding in the hole. They bring Malcolm into the hole. I see Malcolm as he walks by my cell, and I'm like, what the hell could Malcolm have done to got put in the hole? This is crazy. Malcolm don't bother nobody. I give it a little bit of time. Later that night, now most dudes sleep all day and they're up all night. So later that evening, I get on the door and I yell down to Malcolm, hey, Malcolm, what's up with you? Who's that? It's Jay. What's up, Jay? What are you doing? I'm in the hole. What'd you do, man? They got me back here on some humbug shit. Humbug? What did you do? Humbug is like bullshit. Humbug, what did you do? Man, I ain't even going to get into it, but I ain't do nothing. They threw me back in the hole. They don't really throw you in the hole for nothing unless you've made somebody mad. You go to the hole, you're going under investigation or with a charge. One of the two. You've done something or you're suspected of doing something. Man, they got me back here on some humbug shit. Well, what charge you get? Man, I don't even want to get into it. It's all bullshit. We have an inmate. They have a kitchen inside the, in the hole. It's called Tin Building. And these guys just pretty much, the food comes over from the main kitchen. They put it on trays. They put them on carts. And then it goes to each tier. And then an inmate that works back in the hole pushes the cart down the tier and feeds the inmates. The dude that's been feeding us, you know, for the longest now, wears a kufi on his head. He's Muslim. We know he's Muslim. The kufi tells you, he, you know, he's Muslim. He gets to Malcolm's cell, and with everybody listening, he hands him his tray, and Malcolm tells him, hey, I don't eat this. I'm on common fare. Common fare is a different food than what we eat. They don't eat any of the, the soy stuff or... They, they get a lot of vegetables, a lot of peanut butter. It's a whole different diet than what the rest of the inmates eat. Tells him, hey, hey, brother, I'm on common fare. Not your brother, man. He pushes a regular tray in there. They exchange some words. Malcolm's in his feelings about this tray. And dude pretty much calls him, um, 
gay, but not gay, just called him gay in a whole lot of different ways, like as messed up and derogatory as he could make it. And it peeled out, right? Malcolm's on the door now, and all that Muslim he had in him has, has it's there, but it's left. He's angry. He's not humbling himself. He's not being the dude I'm used to seeing him be. He's on the door snapping, telling dude, you know, I'll do this to you, blah, blah. Don't you ever disrespect me. You want to play with my food, boy. When I get out of here, I'll catch you in the yard. Remember now, Malcolm is just a tall, lanky, skinny black dude with a bald head that I have never once seen so much as make a facial expression that would make you think he was about to get violent. I've never seen him disrespect anybody, not greet anybody with, with you know, in the manner they should be. Now, he's down there on his door going at this dude that just finished calling him, you know, all these different names. And as this is taking place, I'm thinking, why is he calling Malcolm gay, right? This takes place several more times. Now, we're coming up on Ramadan. For y'all that don't know what Ramadan is, Ramadan is a Muslim holiday. They feast. You know what I mean? They, they Excuse me. They fast from, you know, anytime the sun is up, they don't eat. But they eat in the morning and they eat, you know, a good sized meal that the, the prison prepares for them. A lot of cereals, things like that is what they're given in the mornings. Then they're forbidden from eating from that morning until that night when the sun goes down. Then they would go over to the chow hall roughly around 7, 7.30 once it was completely dark outside. And the Muslims would all sit down together and eat and they would fast all day long. This lasted for like, don't quote me, I want to say like almost a week. We're approaching Ramadan and Malcolm's back here in the hole with us. This Muslim dude is playing with Malcolm's food and we know that he knows what's going on, but you can't really get on the door. But like, hey man, why you keep calling him gay? You know what I mean? Like you don't get in other people's business. The most you could do is just listen. It's going to eventually come out. After about the third day now, he's not giving Malcolm the right trades and we're approaching Ramadan. Him and Malcolm have words again. Every dude's not really saying much to Malcolm now. Malcolm will spaz on him. Like, man, shut your gay ass up. And he'll roll out with his kufi on, pushing the cart, right? Gets to a point where Malcolm is real reckless with his mouth now. Anytime dude comes on, Malcolm is not the Malcolm we remember. Malcolm is whoever he was before he became Muslim. Malcolm is that dude he was in the streets. Malcolm's not acting Muslim at all when this dude comes on. Still making his prayer five times a day, doing all that. But when this young Muslim dude comes on, Malcolm spazzes, right? Dude tells him, man, you don't scare me. Like, and what you need to be worried about is going back out on the yard and the brothers getting their hands on you. This is when everything comes to light. I've told y'all, it always ends bad and it always comes out. Dudes are still listening. Dude says, Yo, you think I don't know? You think everybody don't know that them guards caught you in that cell? having sex with that boy, and that's why you're in the hole? You violated everything we stand for, and you got the nerve to call me brother and ask me to make sure your trades are right and reach out to me. You're a disgrace to the Muslim population. You up in there having sex with another man, and now you want a brother this, brother that? I don't care if you starve. We're standing on the door, and it's so quiet in there, you could hear a pin drop. You could hear the man in the cell next to you breathing it so quiet. He wheels off of the tray. You hear the wheels squeaking on the tray. Child time. Hey, come to your door and get your tray. You get up, go to the door. The guard turns the key, opens the slot. Muslim dude pushes the tray in. You take your tray. They lift the slot back up, close it back, and you're locked in this concrete cell with this metal door. They're steadily going. And this guard that worked back there, all the guards that worked back there, all they did was their job. They didn't say much of shit. They weren't doing much of shit. They were lazy. And that's why they took the whole job because they didn't really have to deal with many inmates. We're all locked in our cells all day, every day. The most they might have to do is come cuff you up and take you to the shower or take you down to the interrogation room or investigators or whatever. They didn't have to do a lot back there. Most of their day was spent sitting in a control booth, answering a phone, looking over cameras, playing Sudoku, answering the radio, whatever, right? Now that all this has been said, I'd been hollering down at Malcolm talking to him. You, I told you prison's a very judgmental place. You are who you kick it with. You are who you associate with. If you run with a, a child molester, you kick it with a child molester, dudes are 100%. If that guy is known to be a child molester, you kick it with him, first thing they're going to think is, 
He's got sex offenses. He's got to. He's kicking it with a child molester. He's kicking it with a child molester. He's got to have sex offenses. If you run with a bunch of killers, everybody's going to automatically assume this dude's a killer. If you surround yourself with lifers, this dude's a lifer. And so on and so on. So now me getting on the door. And, Yo, Malcolm, what's up? Would you all right down there? Why are you snapping on that dude? All that's come to an end. I'm not saying nothing. Ramadan comes around, right? This dude's continued. This Muslim dude's continued to give Malcolm these regular trays. Muslims don't eat pork. We would get pork patties. He'd push the tray right to the slot with the pork patty on it. Malcolm would try to push it back out, and they'd push it in, and it hit the floor. Malcolm ain't really been eating like that. Now, with Ramadan coming up, you eat before the sun comes up, and you eat after the sun goes down. You don't eat all day. If this continues to take place. Malcolm is going to starve, right? Guard comes down to tier at 530 that morning to do count. Muslim uh, Malcolm comes to the door and tells him, Hey, man, what's up with my tray? Today's beginning of Ramadan. Trays will be served between 8 and 8.30. No, I don't. I can't eat during the daytime, man. I, I, it's Ramadan. I eat, you know, before the sun comes up. You lost all them privileges when you got put in the hole. You should have thought about that before you got your ass put back in the hole. You eat like everybody else. Man, it is Ramadan. It is a religious holiday. You have to give me my special trays. I can't eat all day. Like, I'm, what, do you, what do you expect me to eat? Not my problem, sir. Like I said, you want to be Muslim and live by the Muslim laws and religions? Stay in population. Back here, everybody eats at the same time. They come around that morning, go to give Malcolm his tray. He refuses. I don't want the tray. They don't give a shit if you eat or not. You're not going to eat the tray. The guy in the cell next to you can be like, hey, man, can I get that extra tray? Exactly what they do. Go to the next cell. Hey, we got an extra tray. Yeah, you can have two trays. The guy in the cell next to him is like, Yes, don't eat, Malcolm. Like, stop eating forever. Never eat again. Let me, I need to eat. This, the trays back here are so slack and slim. You will starve back there. The portions are just next to nothing. Lunchtime rolls around. They come to a cell. I don't want it. He doesn't eat. They bring the next tray around. Dinner time trays probably 4.30, 5 o'clock. I don't want it. That night, guard comes through. Malcolm's on the door. Hey. It's Ramadan. Where's my tray? Like I told you, this is supposed to be a special diet, a special food that they get during Ramadan that's supposed to be on this tray. Trays already been passed out, sir. You bucked your tray. You didn't want to eat. You're not going to eat. Malcolm, now he starts screaming, it's Ramadan, going off on him. In the days to come, Malcolm would buck every tray. This one I talked about in the beginning, someone standing up for what they believe in or bonding together. Now, there were other Muslim dudes on this on this block that understood that going to the hole, they had lost all Ramadan rights. Back in the hole, you lose all rights. You don't have many rights to begin with, but they're not abiding by any religious laws back in the, in the hole, right? <coughs> days and days and days have gone by. Malcolm is not eating. They're giving Malcolm strays to other people. And you can hear it in his voice. You can hear... Like the life leaving him when they come to his tray, when they come to his cell with tray, it went from him snapping, I don't want the fucking tray, to them coming to the cell and him, I'm not hungry. A couple days will go by, and you're talking days, this man is not eating. Days and days and days. They come by his cell and that snapping in him, all that animosity and anger, he's now so weak from not eating day after day after day after day that he's not even really responding. You know what I mean? He's keeping it. Keep it moving. I don't want to trade. And it's went from him yelling to almost like a mumble. They come through, I guess it would be, I don't know, maybe six days in, seven days in. And the entire Ramadan period, this man is not eating. He is bucked. He has went on what we call a hunger strike. I'm not with that hunger strike shit. If we have to all do it to get our point across, yes. But me just decide not to eat, I mean, hey, big salute to you. I couldn't have done it, right? Six, seven day rolls around. They come to push trays, and I hear the guard get on his walkie talkie. They get to Malcolm cell, and he says, We need medical. We need medical. We need to get medical in here, right? Dudes are, Man, don't nobody give a shit about what's going on there. Pass them trays out. Because once medical comes in, they're going to stop feeding. If you ain't got your tray yet, you got to wait for all that to be done. It might be another hour and a half before they get back to pushing that cart around to feed people again. Man, we don't give a shit what's going on in Malcolm cell. Y'all need to pass them trays out. Guys, I'm going to have to wait on. We got a situation over. We don't care nothing about him or the situation. Pass the trays out. They come in, and Malcolm has 
not eating and drinking. I mean, I'm sure he had to have drank something to be alive. But so much time has passed now without him eating or drinking and him going on this hunger strike due to them messing with him, his religion, and the Ramadan, you know, um, thing that's taking place. With him not eating, Malcolm has now fell out laying in the floor. They come in, slight pulse. You hear the nurses down there, we need to get him out, get him to the infirmary immediately. They need to go get fluids in him. They need to get, you know, nutrients in him. They need to get something in him because we all know without that, you will die. They come in with the stretcher, put Malcolm on. Malcolm is unresponsive. They wheel him up off the pod. I didn't see Malcolm no more. Malcolm ends up getting shipped. But after all that said, all that was said and done, the other Muslim dudes came, got on the door and said, that's what he gets. That is Allah's will. That's what he deserved for trying to be gay behind everybody else's back. Nobody sympathized with him. Nobody felt bad that he lay, he literally sat in his cell and starved himself. They said that that was Allah's will. That was Allah's power. Allah had, you know, was punishing him for taking liberties and, you know, trying to be gay when nobody was looking. Malcolm did survive. They got him over the infirmary. Got, I guess, stuck a needle in him and started pumping fluids into him and whatever they do when you damn near starve yourself to death. But it just goes to show you that not everybody's going to sit down and just allow them to do whatever they do. And the time that come after that, they changed it to where the guys in the hole that actually were on religious diets got their religious diets. Guys that participated in things like Ramadan still got their Ramadan rights because... In all actuality, just because you've done something wrong inside of the prison doesn't mean it should affect your religion or your religious beliefs. I had to come up out of that hoodie. It got hot in here fast. The day is moving along, and it is not cold like it was this morning. I've seen a lot of guys going on hunger strikes. It takes a lot of willpower to refuse one of the only things that you have when you're stuck in the hole. And you got to think... Being in the hole is the equivalent of you going in your bathroom, tearing everything out of it except the sink and the toilet, throwing a green mat. Remember the mats you used to see in the high school that were stacked up? That's pretty much what a prison mat is. That's your bed. Imagine taking your bathroom, tearing everything out but the toilet and the sink, throwing a green mat in there, a sheet, a wool blanket, and that's where you live. The one thing we all looked forward to in the hole was eating, food. You save something from each tray until the next meal. You get breakfast, hard-boiled eggs, potatoes, orange juice, piece of bread. You're going to save something from that tray. Usually, I would say, save the potatoes. I put them in some tissue paper, sit them on the counter. When lunchtime rolls around, I'm going to save something from that tray, put it on the counter. Dinner time rolls around, I'm going to save something from that tray, put it on the counter. And that's to help combat the hunger pains that are going to set in that night. Later that night, you're going to be hungry. You're going to feel like your stomach is eating itself. So to watch guys, and I had seen so many do it over time. So many fall out, be taken out on stretchers next to death. To watch these guys do that was just, uh, it was remarkable to have that much willpower. But at the same time, it almost seemed like insanity. I understand now why they were doing it, but I ain't gonna lie, I was hungry as hell. I'm gonna do a lot of things. The last thing I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do, is buck that food, but a lot of guys did. 2009 was a very important year in history. We all know that. And before I get into 2009, think what happened in 2009 that I could be talking about that was important to U.S. history. The election of President Barack Obama. Everybody was excited about, you know, the first black president, Barack Obama becoming president. All these changes were supposed to be made and a lot of changes were made. What a lot of people don't know is that all the changes that were made were good for some people and then bad for others. One of the first things he started working on was the budget. Budget cuts. The prisons were hit with budget cuts I'd have to say, I mean, as far as I know, because I was in prison then, hard. We went from, you would get a 
two rolls of toilet paper and a bar of soap a week to one roll of toilet paper, no soap. So they've shorted you a roll of toilet paper and no soap. Now, if you don't buy soap, so be it. Wash your ass with water. We're not providing soap no more. The trays, the meals we started eating, what we used to get on our tray already wasn't much food. But now the portions were much, much smaller because of the budget cuts. They put almost, I want to say it was a 200% tax increase on loose tobacco. And I think that was done to help farmers. When it comes to prison, if you smoked, you would buy bags of tobacco. It's about six ounces in a bag. And it was like $5 or something for Tops, Bugler, Midnight Special, Four Aces, Kite. They had all these different types of tobaccos they sold, right? Obama gets in office, tobacco goes from $5 or something a bag, which the average guy could afford, to $26 a bag. Guys, they put the memo up, nah, that shit's wrong. Ain't nobody spending no $26. You a damn lie. That's, it don't matter how much it goes up, you're going to pay it. And what people don't realize is also about this, and this is a fact when it comes to prisons, the pay rate for inmates that are locked up has not changed in probably 20 plus years you got guys that start out 27 cent an hour that make up to 45 cent an hour if you're special assignment 55 cent work over main laundry you might get 80 85 cent but 27 cent is the basic pay for a guy that's incarcerated that is his hourly wage 27 cent times have changed 20 years everything has whatever it cost 20 years ago it's quadrupled in the last 20 years but nobody's pay has gone up. So guys cannot afford, when they get their little state check that consists of you know, maybe $30 a month, they can't afford to get food, get tobacco, get their hygiene, get their stamps. The money's just not there unless you have help from the outside or you're hustling inside. I thought for sure that the whole tobacco price increase, the you know all that going through the roof was gonna be the reason they were going to tear this bitch up. Guys ain't standing for this. No, nah, y'all just did what? We'll burn this bitch down. That wouldn't be what caused it. The following year, they actually took smoking out of the prison. And though I did see, I seen dudes get robbed, dudes get stabbed, dudes get beat up. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought, if they're going to, they're trying to take cigarettes from us and tobacco products in general. Oh, man, they're about to riot. They're going to, I mean, they're going to burn this bitch to the ground. You ain't never seen concrete burn. It's doable. They didn't riot. Nobody did anything. Everybody talked about what they were going to do. I kept hearing through inmate.com how, man, when we go to that commissary, if there ain't no tobacco over there, you know there ain't going to be no tobacco. They put a memo up. If there ain't no tobacco over there, we're going to burn this bitch to the ground. Nobody did nothing. The inmates turned on each other. Okay, the prison's not selling no more. That old man over there in that cell has got a whole bunch stockpiled. Get your knives. Let's go. Let's go take it from him. That's what would take place. It became a thing to where the prison implemented. There was no longer any smoking in the state of Virginia's prisons, penitentiaries. Instead of us bucking up at them, turning on them and saying we ain't standing for that, everybody turned on each other. Gangs mobbed up and started robbing dudes. Squads of dudes that weren't gangs started robbing dudes. Some of these lifers that were just off in their head would run up in dude's cells and put a knife on them. Give me that. They didn't burn the prison down. When they reacted was when they started messing with our food. With them doing the budget cuts, the portions we got got much smaller. With them getting smaller, guys start losing weight. We all know, like the Snickers commercial, you're not yourself when you're hungry. When they start messing with your food and you leave out the chow and your stomach is still rumbling, Nobody better say anything to you. The smallest altercation that you might usually brush off and shrug off now turns into a, a full-fledged fight. Now there's knives involved because everybody's on edge because we're not being fed the way we should. They come in with this memo one day and they put it on the bulletin board. A little gay guy comes in the pod. He's got the keys, got his tight booty jeans on, got the, the m and smeared on his lips. Like This is penitentiary, right? Walking around, you got dudes hollering at it. Dude, hey, shot it, what a damn that ass fat. Like, 
Dudes was on them boys, man. This is prison life. That's what dudes was doing, man. Facts. Not everybody, not going to say everybody, but I'm going to say probably one out of 20 was trying to holler at the boys, right? Boy puts the memo up, rolls out the pod. We all get a chance. When we see a memo up, we need to go see what's on that memo. Why did they just put a memo on the bulletin board? That means something's about to change. Effective such and such date, we will no longer be serving lunch. We will be serving what's called brunch. You will be getting a bag when you go to breakfast. When you leave out the chow hall, they will hand you a bag with something in it, and that is going to be your lunch. You will only go to the chow hall in the mornings and at dinner time. We read this and dudes are like, no, nah, this ain't going to happen, man. We already know whatever they're about to put in that bag is some bullshit because they've already cut our portions in half. We're already hungry. You, If you don't go to commissary, it is a bad time to be in prison because you are going to drop weight at a rapid, 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 you know, rate because you're not getting the same calories you were getting last week. You're not getting the same nutrients. You're not getting the same portions. You're hungry. Dudes get together inside the pods and say, hey, look, we get over that chow hall. Ain't nobody taking the bags, man. Man, I got it. Look, we don't care what you say. I don't care if you're hungry. You got a lot of lifers, a lot of dudes that just, we're bucking. Like, we're standing together. I'm with them on this. We can't allow this to happen, man. We already let them take smoking out of here. Straight bitch us on that. We've let them do this to us, that to us, this to us. They keep locking us down. They keep playing with us. No, nah, I agree with everybody. No, nah, they no. Nah. Dudes tell dudes, you leave out that child hall with that little brown bag in your hand and come back to the building, everybody's gonna be on your ass. Don't nobody in here take them brown bags. We leave you out that child hall before you go out that door and exit to go back to your building, you take that brown bag and you throw that bitch in the corner. What that's gonna cause them to do is lose money. If they just prepared, you know, the place up there, it holds thirty seven hundred inmates. If they just made 3,700 sandwiches, 3,700 apples, you know, 3,700 juice packets and put it in this little bag. They just took a hit. You know how many loaves of bread it takes to make 3,700 sandwiches? You know how many? That's 3,700 apples, 3,700 oranges. That's a big hit on the prison. All that food just got swept up, put in the trash, and nobody ate. We go over there, and you got some dudes trying to be sneaky. They want to take the sandwich out and shit. Slide it in their pocket, and dudes look at them like, nah. Don't take nothing out the bags. Because they're going to look at the bags and see, are inmates eating stuff out the bags, or is everybody bucking? We go to child. We come through, and as you put your tray, after you're done with your tray, they got a dude standing there passing out bags. One by one, we come through. They hand us the bag. We take the bag and throw it on the floor. By the time this is done, we have hundreds thousands of brown paper bags piled up a mountain of these brown bags that they're going to start serving us for lunch when we used to get sometimes you might get hot dogs for lunch every now and then you would get chicken for lunch you might get meat rock for lunch you might get the sausage we call donkey dick for lunch now y'all trying to just feed us this, this purple bologna and the bologna sandwiches were some of the some of the worst stuff you could ever eat in your life right we continue to do this for about a week we're bucking. We're bucking. Warden comes in. We're all out in the pod one day getting ready to go to wreck. And they come over to intercom. Everybody locked down. Everybody locked down. We all go in our cells like the cattle we are. Heard up. Go into our cells. When you go in, you don't shut the door. They push a button. Your door slides. Cling. Shut. We're in our cells for better part of 30, 45 minutes. Dude's yelling, Yo, what's up with wreck? Why y'all lock us down? We ain't did shit. Why are we in the cell? We supposed to be out of wreck right now. Dudes are getting mad. Dudes are spazzing out on these on these guards, right? Screaming. The guards ain't responding to us. They're not saying nothing. After about 45 minutes, I've told you, you can hear the front door when it slides over. Shkling. Because when it stops, it kind of rocks. But it, it hits this metal piece and it makes this loud noise. We hear the door shkling. Everybody goes to their door hoping it's a guard to come in so we can spaz on them. Why you got us locked down, right? Mad that we're in a cell. And it's hot in here. You know what I mean? Like, let us out. It's the warden. You got the unit manager with him. Captain with him. Lieutenant with him. Walks out in the middle of the room. I need everybody's attention. Everybody come to the door. We all go to the door. You got two men in each cell staring out the slide at him. 
got the whole top tier, the whole bottom tier, and we're all just looking. What seems to be the problem with the bag lunches? Man, f them bag lunches and f you. Who said it? I said it, bitch. Go lock him up. Then you hear it come from another cell. Hey, you. Them bag lunches. Hey, go lock him up. We all start doing it. You and them bag lunches. We ain't having it. Well, what's the problem? Y'all already messing with our food. We're all yelling over top of each other to the point that he's, hey, I can't hear all y'all. If everybody's going to scream at once, there's no point in me being here. I'll just I'll just put y'all on lock and y'all can eat in y'all cells. And if the bag lunches come back out the cells, y'all stay in the cells. Y'all want to speak, speak one at a time. Dude on the top tier that's a life that's been in there a long time tells everybody, shut up. Shut up. Let me speak. He's one of the dudes that originated and started this whole we're not eating this, man. Y'all going to give us our right portions. You're not going to starve us. You're not going to slack us on our meals. We're tired of this. He gets on the door and says, look, Warden, here's the problem. Y'all got these budget cuts. We've all seen it on TV. We've all read it in the newspapers. You're giving us one roll of toilet paper, a grown-ass man, one roll of toilet paper for an entire week. You're no longer giving us soap. So the guys that can't afford soap don't have soap. So they're having to do things, steal, do this and do that to get soap. Now y'all have cut our food portions in half. We're in here, we're damn near starving as it is with the three meals we get. Now you've come in and taken a full lunch from us and tried to feed us this bullshit bag. We're not eating it. You'll eat it or y'all stay on lock. This is the warden. We had a warden named Warden Hinkle at the time. You will eat it or you will stay on lock. We're not going to eat it. We're not. You will put our portions back to the way they were. And you will continue to feed us lunch like you were. We don't care if you lock us in this cell. Y'all took tobacco. Y'all took the toilet paper. Y'all took the soap. We're already locked up. We don't care. You bring them in here, we'll throw the bags back out the cell. We'll see. We'll see. Y'all will break before I break. I go home and eat steak dinners every night. I go home and eat whatever I want. Doesn't matter to me. This is what the warden told us. He rolls out. You got dudes in the cell throwing shit out the cell. Like, hey, I'm talking... Bars of soap, sodas, batteries, triple A batteries, double A batteries. Boom, humming them bitches at him, trying to hit him, right? Yeah, y'all keep it up. Keep them on lock. A week goes by. We're locked in ourselves. They bring those bag lunches around. And even though we are so hungry that I had commissary, so I was able. You know, I'd take my stinger, make some hot water, make something right in the cell. But a lot of guys didn't have commissary. And those are the ones that, hey, I tip my hat and I salute them guys. They were throwing the bag lunches right back out the cell. Seven days straight now they've been coming through with these with these carts feeding us in our cells because we're bucking on these on these brown bags, right? We're sl we're slinging them bitches. The side of the control booth where it's got this thick, like two inch glass to protect the officers, looks like the countertop that they make <laughs> applesauce on. We're taking them apples and we're throwing the bitches as hard as we can against the control booth. To where the control booth has got it's just covered in splatted apples, oranges, whatever they put in that bag that day. Everybody in there is gonna throw it to the control booth with that officer inside of that booth and try to make it, you know, explode and stick. About seventh, eighth day rolls around, warden comes back in. So y'all just gonna buck, huh? You dude start throwing stuff at him. He leaves out. Comes back in with a whole bunch of them. The goon squad dudes that wear all black, and he tells them. Watch the cells. If anybody throws anything back out that cell, you go up there and you do what you got to do to get them up out of here and make an example out of them. Make an example out of them means go up there, put him in handcuffs, beat his ass, and then drag him out of here in front of everybody, right? People stop throwing things. The dude that spoke last time come to the door and told him, we're not eating the bag lunches, man. Give us our lunches back, put the right portions back on our trays, and this stops. We're all locked up. For once, we're going to stand together. We're not We're not accepting this, man. You can leave out of here with the attitude you had last time. You can go home and eat your steak dinner. But I know by now y'all have lost thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars when it comes to these meals. You can't tell me it's not affecting y'all's budget. It's not affecting the, the money y'all are giving to run this place. It's cheaper just to go back to feeding us. Or we're going to continue to do what we do. The warden left out. They had the riot squad in there. As soon as they turn their back, ping, ping, ping. Dudes are throwing shit. They turn around, look. Everybody's <laughs> like, I didn't just throw a battery at your ass. You know what I mean, everybody just ain't nobody throw nothing. 
He's looking this way. Shoot, battery flies by from that way. He looks that way. Battery flies back this way. Like, we got to get the hell out of here, right? They're ready to attack us. Now they're not letting us out ourselves because we're so riled up. And you got the hungry dudes in the cells that are only eating two meals a day. That when they come out of here, they liable to go upside of one of y'all's head and hurt y'all. That night, and the warden would usually leave maybe 5, 30, 6 o'clock when all the other guards would exchange shifts. He goes home. Goes home to his wife, his family. At night, about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. We're still locked down. We ain't been out of our cell in over a week now. The warden comes back in the middle of the pod and says, Y'all win. Y'all win. There's nothing else I can do. I'm going to have to start explaining to, you know, the main place why they're getting all this paperwork pushed and grievances, why the meals aren't being eaten, why we have so much food being wasted. I'm going to talk to them and we're going to go back to our regular feeding schedule. What about the toilet paper and the soap? Do you want to eat or do you want to extra roll of toilet paper and a soap? We'll take the food. We'll take the food. They rolled out. The following morning, we all come out of our cells. Pod is trash. There's stuff that everybody's thrown out that the guards are coming through and having to clean this up. They got inmates. They, hey, come on, clean this up. I'm not cleaning that shit up. We're in there. You better not clean that shit up. Make them guards clean that shit up. Don't clean that shit up. Dudes are bucking. They're not cleaning up. Make the guards clean it up. We come out the next morning. There's still shit all over the floor, batteries everywhere, splatted oranges and apples. The pot is torn up. There's stuff thrown everywhere. There's bologna that's been stuck to the wall for days now. Peanut butter sandwiches stuck to the walls for days now. We went back to our normal routine. Went to breakfast that morning. Our trays were back to normal. The right amount of food was on there. We went in, came back from breakfast, went to rec, went to lunch. They gave us our trays. Went to dinner, the portions are correct again. That was one of the few times I've seen everybody stand up for something. That was one of the few times we bonded together. It wasn't the only time. I'd seen it have pop off over ice. I'd seen it pop off over the phones before. The phones were off one time for almost two weeks, and it got real violent when dudes couldn't use them phones. Guys bid with them phones. You take that phone away, you've robbed a lot of people of their everyday routine. Messing with the commissary. I've seen it jump off over them bucking on our commissary. But that was a proud moment. And there's no pride in being locked up. There's nothing to glorify. In no way, shape, or form will I ever say I was proud to be locked up. But that was a moment that I felt a sense of pride. That regardless of our colors, regardless of our religious beliefs, our affiliations, our gender beliefs, we all stuck together for one you no know, larger cause. And in the end, we got the results we were looking for. It's sad it had to come to that. It's a good thing nobody really got hurt. A couple officers got smacked in the side of the head with, you know, batteries, adapters, oranges. The officers already knew. Like they would come in and clean up at like three, four o'clock in the morning when almost everybody was asleep. But then dudes would still be waiting on them. Fing and throw something at them. I still hit them batteries ricocheting. It ended without violence, any serious bodily harm or violence because they kept us locked in our cells for all that time. But in us bonding and standing together, we ultimately got what we were looking for. I don't think that if, I'm going to be 100% honest with you, if we had all come to an agreement on a hunger strike, yeah, that probably wouldn't have happened. There's a couple dudes in there that are just, out there or mentally strong enough to just completely stop eating but to get in each pod there's 86 men to get 86 men to completely stop eating that ain't gonna happen you got some dudes in there that are you know that are on honey bun and snickers bar diet you got some dudes in there that you know if you cut them sugar will come out their blood type is diabetes like like, like straight up you kick their teeth out and it looks like icing like some of these dudes just eat sweets all day drink coffee all day Soups, chips, they're not going to go for that not eating. But when it came to us bonding together, throwing them bag lunches back out the door, it happened. And there is a sense of pride when you're, some, when you're part of something that's bigger than yourself and you know that's going to make a change, not just where you're at, but throughout the prisons. They tried to do this, I know, through every building where I was at. I don't know much if they tried to do it where they, you know, they tried to do it at other prisons, but I know that what we did in those seven, eight days changed everything and took it back to normal guys no longer will go over there they'd still be hungry 
but not as hungry as you would be if they cut your pork. Anyways, this past weekend, I went to Terra on the Farm out in Ashlandbury Farm in Virginia. Did the haunts, the hayride, the, all the haunted houses and mazes, and then the other three activities. It was a good time. I think I'm going to throw some of that. I did a lot of recording. I'm going to throw some of that footage together for y'all. Some family time we spent. And uh, give that to y'all this week just to let y'all see a little bit of what goes on outside of this YouTube universe that I'm wrapped up in. But for now, I'm going to get back to work. Be at Bush Garden tonight and show y'all some of that. Because I'm no different than y'all, man. I'm just a guy that enjoys being behind the camera and has, you know, a truth to tell. Anyway, these jails, institutions, detention centers, these prisons, they're all just crazy worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. Just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones. And there are some real ones out there. Because y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute. Ding!